and I'm also really excited to talk about um, building a culture of security at the New York Times. Um, and by that I mean more on the security awareness side, um, so more on um, training, um, empowerment, sort of fostering that culture between different teams, not just within the InfoSec team specifically, but with um, developers, with legal, with finance, with HR, with the newsroom, um, and also within the sort of wider information security community. Um, figured I'd talk for probably around 40 minutes or so, and then um, if people have questions at the end, I will be happy to take them. So with that, so I am the Director of Information Security for the Newsroom at the New York Times. Um, I've been there for about a year and a half. Um, initially, my role was security specifically for the newsroom in the past sort of three, four months. My remit has expanded to be more um, security on like the business side of the company as well. And by business side of the company, I mean uh, basically anything but the newsroom. So at that point, we're talking infrastructure, we're talking the rest of the technology department, legal, finance, HR, advertising, all of those other groups. Um, the Times is sort of a, an interesting company to work for in the sense that people still talk about newsroom versus business. In many ways, they do operate in two silos and um, in some cases are also independent of each other. And the newsroom also has a tendency to report on itself. Um, so if there's um, a lawsuit going on, the newsroom will write about that. If there are any security incidents going on, the newsroom will also write about that. Um, I've also had sort of an interesting experience where someone in the newsroom called me up at work and tried to use me as a source for one of their stories, which was a bit of a sort of an odd feeling. Um, I ended up just hanging up um, I wasn't quite sure how to handle that one. So, um, a lot of fun. Um, previously, I worked for Gotham Digital Science in London. Um, fantastic team, fantastic people that I still, um, still talk to every now and then. Um, I worked for the Tor Project and Freedom of the Press Foundation as well. Um, and I spent a lot of time just working with other media organizations. I worked with a lot of human rights activists. I worked with a lot of freelancers. So that's the sort of space that I've been in before coming to the Times. Um, I think tour at the most was probably like 20 people. And the Times is more like three and a half thousand, four thousand people. Um, so just for me now in the past year and a half, um, trying to figure out the sort of American corporate culture and um, how to work at more of a, like a corporation as opposed to a nonprofit, I think has been a, a bit of an interesting experience as well. Um, I like puzzles um, and I hack things for fun. A couple of years ago, I hacked a um, sniper rifle that has its own wireless network. Um, cannot fire remotely, but we could uh, lock the trigger so you can't fire at all. Um, for me, that, that project was sort of fell into the category of, I want to do this just because I can. It was sort of like a checkbox for me to be able to just do something for fun, for shits and giggles, and go present at Black Hat and Def Con. Um, and I still do that. That's sort of what got me into security in the first place. It's the puzzle. It's the challenge. It's the really not quite knowing how something works and then me being able to sort of poke and prod and research and study and really figure that piece out. Um, I also just like knowing how to do things that I'm not really supposed to do without necessarily doing them, but I just like knowing how. Um, and I also really enjoy helping people do different things securely. Um, so when I first started at the Times, um, I was sort of put in this situation where the newsroom wasn't um, wasn't, wasn't really aware of how to best interact with the security team. 
the security team was more sort of enterprise corporate security and not sort of really embedded in the newsroom. And so you had the situation where people needed help. They weren't quite sure who to go to. I was then put into this um, situation where I had to introduce myself very quickly and gain people's trust really quickly and build relationships really quickly. And you're not going to do that if you sort of take this approach of, um, oh, you want to do it like that? No, you can't do it like that because that's the wrong way. So I try and take the approach of, OK, that's what you want to do. Fantastic. Now, let me help you do that securely. I'm not going to be in your way. I'm not going to say no, but I'm going to help you achieve your goal in a secure manner. Um, so people often ask me if I've ever sort of gotten any pushback in the newsroom if, um, if there are people that sort of don't listen or, or if they sort of try to argue with what I'm um, suggesting. And not really. Um, so far, the newsroom has um, been very, very positive to the work that we're doing and the initiatives that we're spinning up and uh, the time that we take to help them with different projects or just create processes on our end to better support them with their work. Um, they don't necessarily always follow our advice, but I think that's the case regardless of which side of the company you're on. So the New York Times, I said, has existed for a very long time. Um, it's been continuously published in New York City since 1851 and has been family owned since 1896. So for me, before I started working at the Times, um, I had of course heard of the New York Times, but I wasn't, it wasn't a subscriber, I wasn't a very frequent reader. Um, and for me it was sort of like I always pictured the New York Times to be a bit old school. Like it's not, it's not BuzzFeed. It doesn't have lists. We don't necessarily do memes. Um, our goal is to help people understand the world. That is what our reporting does. Um, and yeah, we've won like 122 Pulitzers. We report from like 150 plus countries last year and we have about 1,300 reporters. So if you think of the number of people that um, need to have some sort of like engagement from the security team, 1,300 reporters, the newsroom is around, I would say 1,400, 1,500 people, and then you've got the business side as well. So times have been around for a long time and um, things are changing like they should, but um, that the fact that the times is changing is causing some interesting challenges for the security team as well, and I'll get back to that um, later on. Um, on the question of are we failing? Is the New York Times actually failing? Um, no, I think that we're doing pretty well. Um, we've got 3.3 million total paid subscriptions across all platforms, so you can subscribe not just to um, the paper, but there's print, there's digital, you can subscribe to crosswords and sort of different pieces like that. Um, earlier this year, we announced that we made more money on digital-only subscriptions than we did off of print advertising, which has not been seen before. Um, and at the same time, we have these two reports. There's the innovation report that was published in, or rather it was published internally in 2014 and someone linked it to BuzzFeed. Um, and it really talked about where the Times is at, um, the digital strategy, what we need to do to change moving forward, how we're going to ensure that um, our, um, that our business is sustainable, that we can continue to send reporters to all of these countries, that we can continue to cover all of these different stories. Um, got linked to BuzzFeed. Um, a lot of people were really, really interested in seeing how the New York Times was going to handle this shift from mainly print to majority digital. Because a lot of uh, media organizations are sort of struggling with the same thing, but I think a lot of people were viewing the Times as like, if we're over here and we're this small and we're struggling with this, how will the New York Times be able 
to cope. Um, earlier this year, we published the 2020 report, um, which sort of illustrates exactly how, like where we're at from the innovation report and how we're gonna take that and be even more successful in 2020. And that report really highlighted uh, the need for change within the newsroom specifically. It's, it's a pretty interesting report and it talks about um, changing how we cover stories, changing the types of stories that we cover, um, focusing more on visuals. In some cases, a story can be represented uh, just as well by five photos and maybe a video than by like 5,000 words. So figuring out that balance is something that the newsroom is looking more at now than perhaps what it was five or 10 years ago. So that's a shift in the newsroom um, specifically that is sort of also creating some interesting challenges for us. Um, and I was trying to figure out sort of out of all the challenges that we have as a security team of right now three people for all of New York Times, um, I sort of came up with um, three areas where you have the newsroom needs to change just on its own and uh, to sort of meet the goals laid out in the 2020 report just by being the newsroom and reporters doing what they do that's an additional challenge for the information security team and then we have some fun stuff on the business side as well that I'll get back to. Um, so first challenge is sort of the newsroom has to change and has to adapt and things need to move a bit faster. We need to be a bit better at um, creating stories that readers actually want to read and not just sort of publishing something because everyone else is writing about it. Um, trying to figure out which stories are actually valuable and working on those instead of sort of just running with the same stuff that you can easily find in 20 other publications. Um, readers must be a bigger part of the report. Um, there's a comment and sort of common moderation system that we're working on. So we'll be taking a lot more input from readers, doing more to engage with readers. That presents a challenge for the information security team in terms of um, just receiving information from the public, taking, taking comments, um, threats, harassment, doxing, that type of stuff. Those are, that's, those are sort of pieces that I would say traditionally does not fall to the InfoSec team, but at the times it does. We are the team best equipped to handle those types of challenges and we can then work with um, say legal or external parties on best handling and addressing those different um, incidents as they pop up. But that's sort of, a challenge that has popped up in the past, past couple of years. Um, the newsroom is sort of also changing how it does the sort of gathering of the information that leads to like the final stories and how we gather tips and how we use social media. Um, I'll get back to um, our tips channel a bit later on, but um, last year we set up this tip channel that means that the public can now contact the New York Times through email, Signal, WhatsApp, um, and a couple of other channels. And it's been, it's been interesting to see how valuable that has been for the newsroom, but it also means that that's yet another way that people can send us stuff that we probably shouldn't click on or probably shouldn't open. Um, in terms of fake news, um, people, often ask if we've sort of seen fake news or if we have the same type of, of sort of, um, I guess, attacks that, that Facebook is seeing these days. And um, I don't have any sort of solid data to say like we've definitively not had any issues with that, but I can't point to like a specific story right now that would illustrate that we've had that either. So sort of like, I think fake news is a, overall topic, something that we should keep in mind, something that we should be concerned about, but um, that's sort of where I have it on my list of priorities right now. We did have an incident where um, someone sent something to our tip line and it was something related to politics and Trump and Russia, and I forget the exact phrasing, but 
of course, we had a reporter reach back out to try and engage with the source. And then later on, um, we heard from someone else that it was 4chan uh, posting on a board trying to get the New York Times to pick up their story and write about it. Uh, but it seemed like they hadn't really fully thought out their plan because I guess they didn't expect us to reach out in the first place because we reached out and then the board sort of blew up with, shit, they answered. What are we going to do? What are we going to tell them? What should the headline be? Um, but that's sort of one of the challenges that, that we have and sort of the security team has to figure out how to, how to engage with, with a newsroom that has to adapt and has to move so, so, so quickly. Um, which is sort of like on a related note, <clears throat> so we try and we try and implement secure defaults and sort of usable alternatives for the newsroom. Um, as in, we enforce two-factor on email. We don't ask people to set that up themselves. Um, that's just sort of one default. We have a process for if you're traveling, here's a clean laptop than you can use. And we communicate that out so that every single one of our reporters will be aware that that is an option that is in place. It's not necessarily always feasible. Um, sometimes trips are planned days, weeks, months ahead of time. Other times something happens at 6 a.m. and we have someone on a plane by 9 a.m. and they haven't had a chance to stop and pick up a clean laptop. Um, so we are sort of working with um, best possible option given, given the scenario. Uh, we, don't we don't always have the luxury of going with the ideal solution. And, and I don't necessarily think that there's always an ideal solution. We have to just take whatever scenario pops up, we have to make an on the spot decision of what we're going to do in that specific case. Whether that a tip comes in, someone clicked a link, someone opened a document, someone's getting on a plane, someone's actually going to meet a source. Um, and we just have to figure out how to, how to best um, meet those needs. We can't necessarily write like a decision tree or like these are the types of scenarios that, um, that, that we can help you with. We sort of just say anything goes and we will help you come up with something that will work for you for this specific context. Um, I think it's also pretty interesting that um, as a security pr practitioner, I've in the past sort of told people that, you know, you shouldn't be clicking links in emails from people you don't know. And you should be careful with email attachments as well. But you can't give that advice in the newsroom. It is the newsroom's job to click on links and open attachments and communicate with people they don't know because that is how they get their stories. And that also means that we're essentially in the position of helping them click on links securely, helping them open all sorts of random attachments securely. We can't tell them not to do it. And we don't necessarily always have time to, um, let's say someone emails me a PDF and asks me if it's safe to open. There's the ideal way of doing it, as in like you can set up, you can take an air gap, or you can spin up a sandbox, or you can do all of these sort of technically neat from a security perspective, correct ways of analyzing that document. But if it's a breaking story and the reporter needs to know what is in that document in the next five minutes, you need to sort of toss out your solution and be able to come up with something new. So that's sort of another one of the fun um, challenges that we have. And then lastly, infosec visibility versus newsroom privacy. Um, there's been a lot of sort of back and forth about whether or not um, deep packet inspection is something that is actually helpful from a security perspective. And I think if you ask anyone um, who's purely on the, sort of from a purely information security perspective, having that visibility is good. It means more data, it means you have more information at your disposal should there be an incident. You have a better opportunity at um, identifying what happened or what is currently happening. But at the same time, we have 1,300 reporters who need some level of privacy to do what they're doing, which means that we can't necessarily have all the visibility that we want or need. 
in some cases. So that's sort of like a tricky balance as well um, that we run into from time to time. And again, it just sort of goes back to the like on the spot, context specific. Um, sometimes we get more visibility, sometimes we don't. Um, then on the business side, things get a lot of fun. Um, we've spent, I would say two years now, um, doing a lot of work to sort of improve the underlying infrastructure, consolidating a lot of stuff, getting off with um, data centers, moving everything to the cloud. Um, we, I wanna say recently, probably May, April, May, I'm guessing, um, published or rather republished our, the um, news app on iOS, rewritten in Swift. That's sort of one example of how our tech is changing. There's a lot of like rewriting of software, rewriting of stacks, redeploying, um, a lot of sort of CICD, DevOps, DevOpsSec, DevSecOps, whatever we're calling it these days, um, where again, we have to figure out how we as the security team like fit in to all of this. So we still have legacy stuff. We still have some other stuff that deploys like once a month or something like that. And then we have the stuff that deploys like 20 times a day. And that is a lot for any team to handle, I would say. Um, so this is um, just a quick example of um, our website um, that will be I know that some users can see this version of the website today and we're sort of slowly rolling it out to more people um, later this year. But that's, um, the blog post really covers the um, React Relay GraphQL pieces that are sort of under the hood of the website redesign. So not only do we have the newsroom that's adapting and the newsroom just having very special needs, we have a technology department and just business arm of the company that is doing a lot of new stuff as well. And we need to be able to keep up with every single one of these pieces. So I figured I'd cover sort of, I wanted to talk about sort of five things or five um, components, I guess, um, of something that we're doing internally at the times that um, appears to be successful. I don't have like specific metrics for it, but in terms of just building a culture, ensuring that you can get more work done as a team. Um, so five things that have sort of been very successful for us. Um, first one is training, um, where we really work to understand our audience. We don't go in and just pretend that we know exactly what it is that they're doing. We spend a lot of time focusing on role-based security awareness training. So um, by that I mean I recently met with, trying to figure out which department it was, um, recruiting and before going in and giving a security training to the recruiting department, I wanted to first understand what their sort of day-to-day -day workflow looks like and what their challenges are and what the main questions are, what are the systems that they interact with the most so that I can put together a training deck that is actually gonna be specific to them and the work that they're doing. If I had walked in with a deck that I used for the newsroom, they would have sort of fallen off somewhere in the first piece of it because how to securely communicate with sources is not gonna apply to recruiting. They may find it in interesting, but um, it's, not, it's not gonna be as applicable. Um, so we really spent a lot of time making sure that we tailored the training and that the um, audience is actually getting what it needs. Um, we also do new hire orientation training. We get, uh, for the newsroom right now, we get one full hour with every new hire. So we get to cover not just the standard laptop setup and what to do if you have questions or what to do if you need to reset your password, but we also do get to talk about um, our tip line and secure communications and mobile apps and encryption of data and all the other pieces that we can actually help with, how to recognize phishing, 
all of those types of fun stuff. Um, you also do brand bag sessions with external speakers. That's something that um, I found to be uh, very, very helpful. Earlier this year, we got a lot of questions about the travel ban and what to do um, in, if or when you are stopped at the border. Um, so we then pulled in a couple of external lawyers and so that we could talk about what do you do from a technical perspective, what do you do from a legal perspective, what will the company help you with, and at what point are you sort of on your own. Um, the short version there is that uh, if you're a US citizen, they have to let you back into the country. Um, to some extent, it just depends on your appetite for risk as well. Um, but brand bags with external speakers has also been super helpful. Um, from what I've heard in many cases, um, if you as the security team are having a hard time engaging with a certain audience, it may not be um, it may just be because you're internal and actually having someone externally come in and say the exact same thing it can actually be pretty helpful. So just something to keep in mind. I don't know why that is, but that seems to be the thing. Um, so we do regular phishing assessments. Um, we target two departments, desks, different teams. I've done um, newsroom specific phishing exercises. The newsroom is pretty good at recognizing the sort of garden variety phishing. But once it gets a bit more targeted, um, the numbers really change. And it seems like um, there's more training to be done for that specifically. But what we do there is that we do follow up in individually with every single one of the users that clicked or submitted credentials. We never shame them, but we really want to sort of highlight, here's the email you received. Um, here are the different indicators that you sort of that sort of stood out in the email. Here are the things that sort of pointed to this not being a legitimate email, and here's how you can actually check an email in the future. Um, we do try and gamify the exercises. I know there are a lot of other companies that, that do this as well, and some sort of take it to the point of allowing you to collect points that you can then exchange for like t-shirt or lunch or something like that. We're not quite there, but I noticed that um, the week after running an exercise in the newsroom, I would publish a summary of our um, of, of the exercise with some data on our internal website. Um, and initially, I just sort of saw this as a way of, of just spreading the news, getting people to sort of remember that there is a security team, that we do have a presence in the newsroom. Um, and then it got to a point where I would do the exercise, and by like Monday or Tuesday the week following, uh, people would actually stop me and ask when the report is coming out. Because people are really, really curious to see this data um, and just try to figure out how did they, their desk compare to someone else's desk. Um, so phishing exercise is sort of one where um, what I've seen there is people then also talk to each other on Slack about emails that come in. People report suspicious looking emails more often than before. So we don't have to continuously remind people that they need to do this. Just by actually sending out regular phishing assessments, they are now feeling a bit more empowered to talk to each other, try and figure it out, really question the emails that do come in um, so that they're not just blindly clicking on stuff or opening stuff. A learning reviews is not necessarily specific to the newsroom and it's um, something that the developers were doing long before I got there. Uh, but how, how many do those here at their companies? Some, okay. Um, also known as like blameless postmortems, the whole idea is that an incident happens and you will then talk about exactly what happened and why it happened and what you can do better. Um, what I noticed about those is one, it's a great way to meet your customers. Um, I sort of saw this problem where uh, one team had an issue and that caused another team to have a related issue, but the first team had no idea that the second team was actually one of their customers and using one of their services. And a learning review is actually a really good way of, of just figuring out who's actually using your service, who's um, affected by downtime, for example. Um, it's also a great way for us to actually bridge the sort of gap between newsroom and business side because 
the two really do interact with each other, but not very frequently. And they are often in these two silos, but when issues do happen, it can be that it's an issue on the, the sort of the tech side of the house, but on the visibility side, it's like the website is down, or this one feature didn't work, or I couldn't publish my story. And actually getting those two people together in a room to really talk through it means that you are helping them build that relationship. You're sort of putting uh, names to faces or vice versa. Um, and it means that they are then more likely to communicate in the future, which means that you don't necessarily have to uh, sort of run after them or chase them or communicate between them. You're just sort of helping build that relationship. Um, also a great way to teach others about security. Um, I found that a lot of people are really, really interested in security and they really want to learn more. They want to know when incidents happen. They want to understand what happened, what could we have done better. And learning reviews are actually a really good way of just communicating that type of uh, information or even just give advice on someone's solution. Um, embedded InfoSec is something that we're starting to do. I, I say starting because we're three people and we don't have necessarily time to do, to do it um, at scale right now, but I think we all have this like problem where the number of developers is higher than the number of InfoSec people, which means that you have to find a way to get the developers to be a bit more responsible for the security of the thing that they're working on because you can't be there all the time. You can maybe be there sometimes or maybe an hour a week or sometimes you're just in this position where you have to trust them to come to you when there's a problem and trust that they can actually flag the problems for you. Um, there was a thread on Twitter about a week ago, week and a half ago, where apparently Yahoo back in the day had sort of three types of embedded InfoSec, uh, core, dedicated, and local. So you had the members of the core InfoSec team. They were not embedded. They were sort of hired into and stayed on the security team. Then you had the dedicated um, engineers, if you will, that were hired onto the security team, but they were like subject matter experts in a different topic and would then embed with other teams to help them with their, those issues. And then you sort of have the local, um, also, ref, I guess you can, you can sort of also think of that as the, someone who's hired onto a different team like a developer, but who's really excited about security and wants to learn and sort of wants to be that responsible person on that team that flags the issues for you. And I think that you need all three. Um, and sort of the approach that you take will just depend on the project that you're working with. Um, so right now we have essentially all three. We have core. There are projects where I do embed myself onto or with that team for a week, two weeks, a couple of days a week, depending on the project to really make sure that whatever piece that that team is working on right now actually has eyes on code, eyes on architecture, design reviews, and all that fun stuff. And then we do, again, rely on developers to actually flag issues for us and actually help, um, help us understand what they're trying to achieve, what the issues are. Um, and that's worked out really, really well, and I'm hoping, to, um, I'm hoping that that's something that we can do more of as we, as we grow the team. Um, So this is part of our tips page. Um, the sort of final, final piece that I wanted to touch on was um, it's sort of in line with embedded InfoSec, but it's more um, finding your, I guess, partners in crime, finding the people that you can collaborate with across the organization to achieve different goals. So when we set up the tips page, I collaborated with our now tips team in the newsroom and what I contributed was the security sort of tech sign off for the project. I helped design the process that they're following when they receive a tip to ensure that um, it's logged, it's vetted, it's not malware, hopefully not fake news. Um, and that's an example of a team that was 
purely in the newsroom where I wasn't, I was embedded for maybe a month and now I'm a bit more off, off hands. Um, but that's been a really fun project to work on that's, um, again, you can sort of jump in, you can help out and then you can just take a step back and as part of the work when you're there helping get that project off the ground, you're also then helping the developer or the journalist or depending on who it is, helping them understand what your concerns are, what they should be looking for, what type of issues that they should flag for you. And that's something that's worked out really well for us as well. Um, so just to sort of wrap it up, I think I've got five minutes left. Um, sort of the road to success. Um, culture is, is certainly not the sort of only piece of a security program, but I believe that it must be a part of the program as a whole. You can't just rely on uh, tools or point solutions because um, it's just not, it's not going to scale. And in many cases, the problems that you have will not be problems that can be solved by tools alone. So at some point, you need to trust people to actually come to you with questions, with concerns, with stuff that they want you to review. Um, and by trying to actually teach what you do to other people as part of sort of phishing assessments, training, mentoring, you can sort of help build this culture of security and sort of foster that interest where people will be excited about the work that you're doing and will actually want to engage with you on that as opposed to ignoring you because you don't understand what they do. Um, and finally, I wanted to say, um, I do, I do really put a lot of focus on teaching, not just within the information security team or the community, but just within the company as a whole. I do believe that everyone's got something to teach me about what they do and how they work. And then in turn, I can help them figure out how they can do that securely. So with that, I believe I have a few more minutes for Q&A if anyone has questions. If not, I'll stick around and I'll be around tomorrow as well. So thank you. Any questions, please go to the microphone in the middle. Hello, um, Julien Veillant from Mozilla. I'm very interested in an aspect that you started uh, talking about a little bit. And the New York Times is a global organization. You have people all around the globe. It's a problem we run into as well. We have developers all around the globe, and they travel. And something that came up over the last couple of years, not necessarily related to Trump, but generally uh, in, in the, common, the current landscape, is workstation security when people cross borders. Um, there are attacks out there, essentially, that are pretty much indetectable that can you know, put malware on your BIOS and compromise your workstation entirely. That freaks everybody out. Um, what is your approach? What is your level of concern? Uh, do you just require that you know journalists will change their workstation every time they cross a border? Do you accept some amount of risk? How do you approach that problem? That is a very good question. Um, I think that goes back to sort of the ideal versus um, where you can start um, in terms of where you can start. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, travel laptops is something that we do offer. Um, it's not always the case that we can require someone to travel with one. In some cases, there's no time. They just decide not to get one for whatever reason. Um, in other cases, we do have the ability to say, you're traveling to this country, you're crossing this border, you are traveling with a different laptop. <coughs> um, and we also explain exactly why that is. So we don't just say for security, you have to take a different laptop. We really try and sort of help them understand exactly why we're asking them to take a different laptop. And we explain um, what the risk is if they don't. Um, but in terms of technical features, clean laptop, reinstalled OS, full disk encryption. Um, and then at some point, you are also just I think at that point, you've done what you can from a tech perspective and the legal side kicks in as well. 
Um, in some cases, you will just be forced to hand over the laptop, but at least if it's fully powered off, you may have a better chance of um, keeping that data secure than if it was like unlocked or not encrypted. Does that answer the question? Cool. So can you also maybe describe some of the, uh, the challenges from a security perspective moving from traditional infrastructure to some of the cloud-based infrastructure? That is a very good question. Um, I'm just trying to think. I've been uh, mostly mostly in newsroom for like a year and a half now, and I've just recently started to explore more of the business side challenges. Um, I think the the biggest challenge that we have there is not related to the platforms themselves, but that there's so much work happening, and there are so many teams that are now empowered to do this themselves that we're trying to keep up and we're trying to ensure that everything is done sort of the right way and securely and that we still have the visibility that we need. But at the same time, that uh, process has moved so quickly that we're sort of catching up now. Um, I think that is, that is our biggest challenge in that space. Um, I'm not sure if you can answer this question. Uh, it's okay if you cannot. Have you ever been at the crosshairs of a nation state adversary and how did the story go? Um, the New York Times was hacked by China in 2012 when the details are publicly available. Um, so has it happened? Yes. Um, what was the second part of the question? Oh, the, the story about it. So just Probably a story about story it. story is already written. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, that story has, has already been written. Um, I would suggest looking it up. It's a pretty interesting one. Um, but it, it has happened. It is a risk. It is something that we do think about. We do recognize that, yeah, we see adware in the environment, but nation state actors are also the, within our threat model. Um, so it's something that we do keep in mind. Thank you. The reporters are fiercely protective of their sources. How do you protect someone in your like, look at this PDF example, is this sketchy? If well, someone on your team looking at that PDF might disclose who the source is for some story, how do you both protect people by looking at their things while blinding yourself to their things? That is a... Um... Or I should say, how do you balance those? <laughs> We, so that for me goes back to the piece about training where we, we spend an hour with every new uh, hire in the newsroom so we get to fully explain our processes so that they can make an informed decision whether or not to send us that piece of information. So sometimes we'll get a PDF that's almost like, I don't really care about this, I don't know who it is, just check it for me, all the way down to um, someone's just not telling us something at all because they don't want us to have that data. We're somewhere in between where we get some information but it's somewhat vague because the reporter is protecting a source or a story or they're just a bit cagey for whatever reason. But we do try and make sure that the reporters can actually make an informed decision about whether or not to fully loop us in. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Runa. Please give another applause. Thank you.